Great. Okay, thank you, Alex, for that lovely, thorough introduction. Um, it's really a great uh, pleasure and honor to, to speak to you guys here at Torbog. Um, I thought I would just date myself slightly and um, refer to uh, another bug, which was a van bug that I've attended. I think this was an early in my PhD and it was really uh, a memorable and inspirational um, presentation that Mike Eisen gave. And he was talking about computational methods and, and studies in, in yeast and flies and so forth. But he ended with this kind of impassioned plea for the um, Public Library of Science Initiative, which was really at that time um, in the nascent stages. Uh, and he was kind of going around and making a pitch for the, the benefits and value of open access uh, journals and open access science, which at the time, aha, we've got the shirt from, I'm guessing it's Francis, yeah, who probably had a part in, in inviting and organizing that. Um, so yeah, that was extremely um, inspirational, motivational for me. And together with the, the open science ethos of Steve, Steve Jones Lab in Vancouver, um, really set me on a path um, towards really believing in the openness and the importance of open science. So I kind of wanted to present this thesis that uh, open source software, open access data and transparent methods can improve reproducibility uh, and accelerate science and, and application uh, in specifically the field of precision oncology. So that's kind of the theme of the talk. Um, the Griffith lab that I co-lead with uh, my brother Malachi is focused primarily on cancer genomics and informatics um, across many different projects and cancer types. Obviously, I won't be able to cover all of that or even much of it. Uh, and many of these uh, tools that I'm going to touch on will be um, discussed today, but others will not. Um, and then we're also very uh, proud to engage in bioinformatics training with both the a Canadian Bioinformatics Workshop Series that again, uh, Francis and Michelle and others here play a, a major role in, as well as at Cold Spring Harbor um, and through our online resources. Uh, so if you're interested in, in any of this, you can, you can go and read about it on the lab webpage. So now I'm gonna give maybe like three slides of really high level background that I'm sure everyone in this audience knows perfectly well, um, basically, with the advent of high throughput, massively parallel sequencing, we've kind of seen this explosion of cancer genomics, uh, where you take uh, samples from different uh, tumor sites and uh, different germline sources, and you can produce now hundreds of millions of paired end short reads, uh, which aren't as short as they used to be. Uh, maybe now they're like 200 or two by 150 or two by 250, depending on the exact um, configuration. And with those short reads, you can do many kinds of omics. Um, mostly the examples I'm gonna talk about today, um, to the extent that I'm even gonna talk about kind of classic cancer genomics, uh, have revolved around whole genome and exome and whole transcriptome sequencing. But of course, this cartoon could just you know scroll down for pages uh, with different kinds of epigenomics and so on. And they're all building on this basic premise that if you fragment a sample of nucleic acid, RNA or DNA and um, attach different adapters to it and sequence it on one of these massively parallel platforms uh, in different ways, you can align those reads back to usually a reference genome, although they're all also of course de novo assembly-based approaches and so on. And you could look for discrepancies or quantitative data in those alignments that teach you things about the genome, um, teach you basic biology, identify specific alterations. In our case, we're primarily looking for tumor-specific alterations, which may be important in driving the development of cancer and or um, potentially targetable in some therapeutic way. So there have been a plethora of studies that have tried to tie these molecular alterations to 
um, prognostic or diagnostic or uh, predisposition or therapeutic response um, endpoints. So we're going to talk more about some specific examples of that uh, when we talk about the civic knowledge base. Uh, but all of this is to say that a kind of combination of um, advances in technology um, have really made a new kind of precision medicine possible. And we're starting to see anecdotal cases where we can apply these genome scale methods like whole genome sequencing and transcriptome sequencing to actual patients. And I'm just gonna share one experience that I was part of um, that was highly motivational for much of the research that's gonna follow and that I'm gonna describe in the talk. So this is our colleague, Dr. Wartman. Um, he's a leukemia doc at Washington University. You may have heard this story before. Um, it was published in the New York Times. And he wrote a really cool um, personal N of me kind of case study uh, describing his experience in um, molecular case studies. So I encourage you to go and check that out. It's really interesting to hear uh, the perspective from a patient who also happens to be an expert um, in both um, molecular biology and, and leukemia, which is the disease that he got. So his clinical history was that he was diagnosed with ALL, acute lymphocytic leukemia in 2003 while finishing his medical school. And he was treated with chemo, which was a standard treatment uh, that has about a 50% success rate in adult ALL. And indeed, he, he achieved a morphologic remission. Unfortunately, in 2008, during his fellowship, um, he had a relapse. That was again treated with chemo, again achieved remission. Uh, he was given a bone marrow transplant uh, from a relative. Uh, at this point, the overall survival for adults with ALL, ALL after a relapse is about 5 to 10%. And unfortunately, uh, he did relapse again in 2011. Uh, at this point, was no longer responsive to the standard chemo, uh, could not achieve remission. And generally, adults in this situation with ALL in a second relapse that's not responsive um, are considered incurable and, and, and invariably, unvaryingly fatal. He was enrolled in a, a study to sequence his whole genome and transcriptome which was still a relatively uncommon thing to do um, for um, kind of active patients at that time. I would say very uncommon. Um, so in the molecular case studies report, you can find some of these quotes. Um, he said that he elected to participate really because he thought that sequencing his genome, the first adult ALL to ever be sequenced, uh, could be a, you know, the first step in understanding the disease and maybe why adults with ALL um, fare differently than children with ALL. Uh, he said, in my mind, sequencing of my leukemia genome was discovery genomics and did not expect the results to be clinically important. Uh, but after the chemo failed in that um, second relapse, um, inevitably he, he started to hope that maybe there's a possibility a novel target might, might result and maybe that might be a chance at survival of this uh, terrible prognosis. So a team of genome analysts that were led by uh, my brother, Dr. Malachi Griffith, um, started um, analyzing this data. I joined about halfway through this um, when I moved from Berkeley to WashU. And not unexpectedly, they were able to identify a very large number of alterations. And if you were just looking at this as a cancer biologist, you could spend a lot of time I'm kind of digging into this. There was a lot of potential drivers. Um, the ZNF384 EP300 fusion has subsequently been shown to be a common driver of ALL. Um, there was alterations in NF1. Um, ICROS, also a well-known alteration in ALL. RB1, a classic tumor suppressor. CDKN1B, it's actually surprising how many drivers there are in this tumor. But as is often the case, um, none of these were particularly actionable or targetable. And it wasn't until uh, we started looking into the RNA-seq data that a clinically actionable target was identified. Uh, and this was in the form of 
extreme overexpression of a kinase called FLT3. Uh, so you can see here the um, individual expression level of that gene um, compared to the distribution of expression levels um, for his sample, um, as well as the expression of this gene in his sample compared to a cohort of other samples uh, for which there was public microarray data. So it is quite unusually highly expressed um, in this tissue type compared to other blood sorted compartments shown here, as well as other um, previously observed ALLs. And it so happens there's an inhibitor um, for FLT3. And he was started on treatment with this inhibitor. Um, it had been approved for other types of cancer at that time and was thought to be a potent inhibitor of FLT3, um, but was um, unproven or untested for adult ALL. And fortunately, he experienced a remarkable response to that therapy. Um, within a few weeks, he was in a complete third remission, uh, which allowed him to have a second stem cell transplant from an unrelated donor now. Um, and he remains in complete remission more than eight years later. There's another paper that we wrote that describes this in much more detail, and it shows how some of these other alterations that we found, um, we were able to kind of design like a custom uh, minimal residual disease monitoring assay for them. And that was partly what allowed us to uh, first detect basically a total absence of disease uh, that gave us the confidence to go ahead with that transplant, um, and also has proved a valuable monitoring tool in the years since. Um, so he has gone through a number of health cha challenges with um, graft versus host disease. Um, but one thing um, that's been reassuring is that um, every kind of recheck with that sensitive assay has shown no uh, return of, of the original uh, ALL. So Lucas himself said, my case is, is not worth sharing because of only his good luck, but because it illustrates how cancer genomics and precision medicine can be clinically relevant. And so pretty much from that day till this day, we've been trying to think about how we can extend these kinds of successes, which are largely anecdotal at that time and to some extent still, um, and extend those successes to, to others, to the patient population at large, um, so that um, you don't need to be, let's say, a, a doc at an academic research hospital known for cancer genome sequencing um, to get comprehensive sequencing and potentially alter the course of your treatment. And what I'm showing here is kind of this um, funnel diagram illustrating the overall process going from raw sequence data through different kinds of event detection, uh, filtering review, annotation, prediction, and ultimately report generation and clinical application. Many aspects of this process have been productionified and standardized and auto automated. And it's really here in this interpretation and report generation and clinical application that a lot of bottlenecks remain. And so I'm gonna talk about some of those bottlenecks or challenges. Um, and I'm just gonna highlight three that relate to this idea of open science. So there's really a lack of open standards. Um, there's a lack of certain kinds of tools that you need to get your job done as a cancer genome analyst. And there's this problem of data siloing. So I'm gonna address each of those briefly. So here's one illustration of the need for standards. So we sequence hundreds of tumors at the Genome Institute and in, in my group. And one thing that plagues us is this, this manual review process. So manual review is this idea that you have these automated variant calls, right? So there's many algorithms to take your raw sequence alignments and produce variants, basically predict those alterations that are different between um, your tumor sample and your normal sample. Um, or between the tumor and a reference or some population. And so it turns out that a lot of those variant calls are not that great. Um, there's a lot of false positives and, and false negatives. Um, and we end up spending a fair amount of our time manually going back to the raw data and visualizing that data 
and trying to convince ourselves that these variants are good and real and truly somatic, uh, that is tumor specific, uh, versus those that may be the product of some kind of artifact or data problem. And the literature is, is chock full of references to this process of manual review. And any genomics paper will either mention it or fail to mention it, <laughs> but most of the time it's happening. And it's often some combination of manual review and ad hoc filtering. And you'll see things like all the indels were manually reviewed in IGV in the integrative genomics viewer. And really that is often the sum total of the description of the methods or approaches and what they mean by manual review. Just, we did manual review, we looked at them. So rarely are the methods or criteria specifically described or, or cited at, in terms of any previously published protocol. And they're definitely not standardized. And we believe this is a, a pretty significant undocumented source of error. And we also know that there's substantial inter-reviewer variability. Um, so we conducted a study uh, in another paper where we looked at this process of manual review and we performed an experiment using people um, to do manual review. And we showed, well, first of all, it's, it's labor intensive and time consuming. So it can take easily an hour for 70 to 100 variants to be reviewed. And that's for a very experienced, um, highly qualified manual reviewer. Uh, when you're learning, it takes a lot longer than that. And we often have thousands of variants, right? Many tumors will have hundreds or thousands of variants. Uh, and many of these studies involve hundreds of tumors. So that's a, a very substantial burden. And we also were able to observe and measure a, a pretty high level of inter-reviewer variability. So we only saw what's considered fair agreement by a CAP statistic um, with really only 77% of variants being agreed by three out of three reviewers in this particular study design or two out of three reviewer, reviewers. Um, most um, were, um, or many of the other 23% or whatever were, were basically discrepant between the reviewers. So we thought a manual review standard operating procedure could help and we developed such an SOP. And I won't go through this in great detail, um, except to say that it kind of walks you through a process for setting up a good manual review session um, and then executing manual review using a set of established criteria. Um, it gives you basic orientation of IGV, which is our recommended tool for performing this review. Uh, we developed a, a simple plugin for IGV that allows you to uh, more efficiently track the product of your review and record it according to the standards that we're going to lay out in a sec. And we came up with a standard set of uh, variant review calls and more importantly of um, recognized artifact tags. And each of these kinds of artifacts was documented with extensive examples in the SOP. So it's kind of a training manual as much as it is a, a protocol for manual review where you can learn what the common sorts of artifacts look like, how to document them, and then how you might use those to disqualify somatic variants, um, basically determine the real from the, the problematic variants. And we performed a, an analysis where we validated variants. Um, we used a set of previously validated variants rather um, from a previous paper. So these were variants that were called from a particularly highly studied AML where we'd done very comprehensive whole genome sequencing, very deep exome sequencing, very deep um, custom capture sequencing and orthogonal sequencing technologies, as well as manual review and came up with this uh, solid set of true positives and, and recognized false positives. And then we gave that set or a subset of those variants to a set of manual reviewers um, with partial overlap between the, the sets that they were to review. And what we were able to show is that by um, using the SOP, comparing performance of, of reviewers with and without training and use of the SOP, uh, we were able to increase the accuracy of their review um, and also 
increase the inter-reviewer agreement or dis decrease that um, discrepancy between reviewers that we're seeing before. Uh, and overall, this actually led to a savings in time as well, because um, with this SOP, you spend less time kind of um, debating ambiguous calls. Uh, so that's one example of an SOP or a standard that we developed um, that we think kind of helps and we published this. Um, it also inspired us to think about what are the features that these human eyeballs, these manual reviewers are able to detect that the algorithms that originally called the variants are failing at. Um, and that led to a deep learning, machine learning project that I, I don't have time to cover today, but I'll just put this up here so you can find the paper um, where we actually dug into that to try and learn those features and try and automate that process. And what we found is that we're able to eliminate about 90% of the manual review burden uh, because there are features that you can kind of after the fact learn from the variant call sets and, and raw data to sort of further refine variant calls and then limit manual review to just the, the truly most tricky cases. Um, this does typically require some um, custom training or relearning of a, of a model on data that um, kind of matches the peculiarities of your sequencing platform and so on. So I encourage you to check that out. The SOP itself was published um, here in Genetics and Medicine. And um, we've subsequently developed a number of other SOPs that have been published. Um, so we have one for curating and clinical interpretation of somatic variants. Um, also one that kind of walks you through best practices for um, developing new or predicting new antigens, uh, primarily in the context of new antigen cancer vaccines. Uh, which is a major focus of the lab, but I won't be talking about today. Um, and then also adapting um, civic curation um, to some ClinGen um, data standards. So that's an example of the kinds of standards that we develop in the group to try to kind of overcome some of this bottleneck in applying genomics to precision oncology. Another major challenge that we faced um, since these, these early examples was lack of certain tools that we needed um, that were either only available as kind of expensive or inadequate um, existing commercial options. And so I'm just gonna give a couple examples of, of some of the tools. One example is GenVisor, which is a bioconductor package. And really the reason that we developed this was um, because in a lot of these early um, cancer genome analysis papers, like if you think of maybe TCGA papers, uh, you see these uh, great plots, like here we're looking at a, like a waterfall type plot um, or other plots that put copy number changes or coverage in the context of, of chromosomes or genomes or specific genes. A lot of these kinds of visualizations in the earlier days were really being created in some terribly painful ad hoc manual ways. I don't know if anyone is old enough, well, some of you possibly are to believe it, but some people would actually make these kind of plots in Excel. Like they would literally have like an Excel that had like 20 by a hundred cells in it and they'd be adding colors in the cells. And so just doing crazy things like that. Um, and the, we, we just found there weren't good, easily accessible, um, tools for creating these kind of publication quality cohort level visualizations for genomics data. And GenVisor was one attempt to solve some of that. And really the, the ethos of this tool is to create basically helper functions where it's as simple as reading in a fairly standard file format like a math file, and then maybe with a single command with some highly customizable parameters, you could produce a nice visualization like this. Um, so you can check that out in Bioconductor. Another tool that was lacking was an, a way to quickly link interesting molecular candidates at the gene level to potential drugs. So in the example of um, uh, Dr. Wartman and many others that we experienced through our efforts in the Genomics Tumor Board, 
we would literally be Googling or searching PubMed for these genes and other search terms, trying to get a handle on the landscape of, of existing inhibitors and therapeutics that might be associated with some of these molecular alterations at the gene level. Um, so we created the Drug Gene Interaction Database, uh, which basically aggregates many different sources of drug gene interactions. Um, there's now more than 40 sources. Um, so these are things like, like Drug Bank, which is an excellent source of drug gene interactions, um, but many others, some of which uh, kind of canonical sources of drug ability, genes that are thought to be druggable, um, which exist maybe only in a table in a PDF somewhere or um, in, a, in a database that doesn't have a, a good search interface or an API. So we aggregated all that data into a common database with uh, a useful web interface as well as a, a programmatic access. And the latest um, version of that um, database has just been published, I think, yesterday in NAR. And it's been cited many times now. Um, I think between GenVisor and DGI, they've probably been cited um, almost a thousand times. This was one very recent example that was just kind of cool to see come up in my Twitter feed, actually, was um, the cell paper that came out a couple of weeks ago where they were doing a uh, genome-wide CRISPR screen to identify host virus interactions for COVID-19. And then they intersected um, their hits with uh, druggable targets so that they could shortlist a set of potential therapeutics um, for genes that seem to be important in the, the host virus interaction for COVID-19. Um, and when I went to the paper, I saw um, DGI DB was prominently featured as the source of drug gene interactions that made that possible. So then the final kind of category of bottleneck or um, challenge is this idea of data silos. Uh, and I'm sure everyone in this audience is kind of familiar with what I mean. Um, here is one example. So there are commercial providers where you can send um, your tumor sample for a patient and get it sequenced, um, typically with a targeted panel. And you receive back a report that might look something like the sample that they provide, and it will have these interpretations. So they'll say PIK3CA H1047R is known to be reported in breast cancer, blah, blah, blah. They'll give a summary and indicate um, potential therapeutic relevance of that um, interpretation or of that variant. What frustrated us with this was that um, these interpretations had limited to no provenance. So we sort of didn't know who said them and when they said them, how current they were. Um, and then there's no mechanism for feedback. So if you do think that there's need for updating or a problem in these interpretations, um, that, that was really impossible because it's, it's part of this lockdown process um, behind uh, a commercial paywall. And so we thought this problem would be better addressed by an open public domain effort. And so we launched the Civic Project um, to address that perceived need. So Civic is an open knowledge base and curation system for the clinical interpretation of variants in cancer. And here we have quite a broad definition of variant, which can be anything from a small single nucleotide variants to expression changes or large scale alterations. Uh, currently it is uh, linked to the gene concept, um, but the next version will go beyond that even um, to sort of chromosome level abnormalities um, or genome wide signatures and so on. So what is a variant of significance in cancer? Uh, we're talking about four main types. Uh, one is predictive of therapeutic response. So the sort of poster child for this is the BRAF B600E predicting sensitivity to uh, vemurafenib or some other um, inhibitor. You could have diagnostic significance where a specific alteration like this rare fusion which happens to very sensitively and specifically define uh, 
a particular subtype of uh, liver cancer. Uh, you can have prognostic, where certain mutations are associated with worse or better outcome in certain tumor types. And then, of course, you can have predisposing mutations, um, where certain alterations that you may be born with uh, predispose you to the development of cancer of a certain type to begin with. And studies describing these kinds of associations are um, very popular and um, growing exponentially. Um, so this creates a large problem to basically stay on top of the literature in terms of all the, the variants that are clinically relevant and, and how they're relevant. And so that's really the motivating need for a database like Civic. Uh, and we really adopted this, this open collaborative ethos um, where um, we're trying to achieve community consensus um, through public contributions and open discussion and uh, standards for curation and review. Uh, we want this to be very transparent. Uh, so the content um, should have complete provenance and acknowledgement of the creators and reviewers and editors. The data should be computationally accessible through both structured data and APIs. Um, it should be freely accessible. Um, and part of that is making it accessible under an open license. Um, and we've adopted the public domain license or CC0 as, as kind of the most open possible. And what that means is that basically anyone can use this knowledge that we're synthesizing um, in any way they wish for um, public or commercial purposes. And we hope that um, we will leverage an interdisciplinary community of researchers, clinicians, um, patient advocates, and others to develop um, this shared resource. And so this is a cartoon kind of depicting what the, the curation process looks like. Um, the idea is to facilitate what we think of as expert moderated crowdsourcing. Uh, so editors and curators can join Civic um, while well, curators can join, editors can sort of apply. Um, they can submit evidence, uh, which is evaluated by editors um, and can either be accepted um, or rejected. Uh, and most often what happens actually is that comments or revisions are suggested, which go through a kind of cycle of revision until it reaches um, an accepted status. And this produces um, a kind of bolus of accepted evidence which are linked to specific variants and are further synthesized into what we call assertions, um, where we uh, come up with a consensus of what the evidence is telling us about the clinical relevance of that variant and integrate it with um, things like the AMP AS ASCO CAP um, guidelines on um, clinical rel relevance tiering, um, as well as um, things like uh, FDA recognized um, assays for the variants and so on. So this is a really quick tour of the civic interface. Um, you can, of course, search and browse in various ways. You can log in if you wish. Um, this is only required if you want to contribute. Uh, so if you want to comment or flag or suggest revisions or even submit uh, new content, then of course you need to create an account. Uh, otherwise, consuming the information is um, completely free and accessible without even a login. Uh, you can add or suggest content, as I mentioned, um, and you can contribute to at least three kinds of expert curated knowledge. Um, so we curate gene level summaries, uh, variant level summaries, and we spend quite a bit of time working on variant coordinate curation to really pin down what exactly we even mean by the variant, which is not obvious obvious in many cases from publications describing variants. Um, and then we have curate structured evidence. Um, and I'm going to show an example of an assertion, which is kind of the final level of curation, where we take um, many lines of evidence that have been curated and synthesize them into a, a kind of summary and description describing the clinical relevance of that variant in the context of a specific cancer um, and maybe a specific drug if it's a predictive evidence type. And as I mentioned before, at this time we can then link to um, things like the AMP tier um, or 
uh, specific practice guidelines or regulatory approvals or tests. So the uptake of Civic, I think, has been quite successful. We've seen a large amount of evidence submitted and um, sometime several years ago, the contributions by the community have vastly exceeded um, our own contributions from, from our group. Um, this has resulted in currently a little over 7,500 interpretations for 2,600 variants, more than 400 genes and 300 cancer types. Uh, curated from nearly 3,000 publications. And this was done by more than 250 contributors. Um, and it's being consumed by thousands of visitors and millions of API hits um, every month or probably every day, actually. Uh, another kind of measure of the success or uptake of Civic has been the adoption by the ClinGen Somatic uh, Cancer Working Group led by Suba and Shashi. Um, who are trying to assemble variant curation expert panels. So these are experts that are deciding on the best way to define the clinical relevance of variants in spe for specific genes or disease subdomains. And they've adopted the civic interface as the primary interface for curation of, som of somatic variants. The open model that I've described has really allowed very extensive community integration and adoption. So because of that um, open license and APIs and so on, um, Civic is very easily integrated into other resources and tools. Um, so both on the commercial side, there are many commercial products that import Civic data, as well as on the academic side. This is just one of probably 30 different examples I could show. Uh, one of the more recent examples that we're really gratified to see is that you can now um, directly visualize civic data in uh, protein paint, which is one of the nicest visualization tools out there for looking at um, the kind of predominant observed cancer mutations uh, for a single gene at a time. Uh, and then you can put the civic variants, the clinically relevant variants curated at civic in the context of observed variants uh, from other data sets like uh, the pediatric data set um, that's been created uh, through the efforts of St. Jude, as well as things like Cosmic and ClinVar and others. And this is really made possible by um, publicly documented APIs. And I kind of put publicly documented in, in bold here. Uh, there are many resources that, that make an API available or have an API that you just don't even know exists, um, but it's not that useful if you don't tell people it exists and then carefully document how to use it. We also have a Python uh, SDK, uh, which serves as kind of a set of helper functions uh, for interacting with the API. And um, this has been published in several different ways. Um, so you can check out the main civic paper there, or just go to civic and see some of the publications. An area that we were kind of really excited to expand into is this idea of going beyond the curation of the knowledge to the actual application. Um, so we conducted a proof of principle study um, where we wanted to use this publicly curated knowledge in the actual creation and design of a panel. So we showed that you could create a panel based on this documented evidence for which variants are clinically relevant. Uh, we validated this by obtaining samples with existing sequence data and then employing the civic-based panel. Um, it happened to be a, SM a SMIP panel um, designed together in collaboration with Stephen Salaponte at UW. Um, and then we kind of validated by comparing um, the results of that panel to the existing sequence data. And it worked quite well. I mean, it was highly concordant. And kind of the, the beauty of this potential system is that you use the knowledge in Civic to both design the panel that you're applying to patient samples. And then that same knowledge is used to annotate what comes back from the sequencing of those patient samples. And then as you kind of work through these cases and maybe identify deficiencies or new knowledge, um, you can submit it to the civic knowledge base and then that can in get incorporated um, into revised designs of your real world panel or assay. Um, so we think this could be a really interesting model going forward as a way of kind of democratizing 
um, access to these custom targeted sequencing panels and the interpretation of the variants result from them. Uh, so again, there's a publication describing that um, in JCO CCI. And if you're interested to participate um, in the civic project, we encourage anyone who wishes to to come and discuss or flag content in the knowledge base, suggest publications that should be curated, uh, suggest revisions to existing content or um, even submit new content. Um, you can join as a curator, you, you can work towards promotion to editor level. Uh, and then finally, I'll just mention um, the VIC or the Variant Interpretation for Cancer Consortium. CIVIC was one of the founding knowledge bases of this um, consortium, which is a driver project of the Global Alliance for Genomic Health. And together with others in the community who host and develop and maintain similar knowledge bases, we're trying to standardize the way that we um, curate and describe variants and to, to the extent possible standardize things like licensing so that we can combine data and avoid unnecessary um, replication of effort between these various um, initiatives. Um, and there was a paper describing this that came out, I think, just last year, um, led by Alex Wagner, who's now at Nationwide, um, kind of showing the initial product of that integration across these knowledge bases um, that involves civic and, and several other prominent variant interpretation knowledge bases. So I think I'm at the hour. So I, I'll just conclude and I, I hope I've convinced you and probably most of you don't need convincing, but that open access data, open source tools and transparency of approaches can really help to improve reproducibility accelerate development and adoption of precision medicine. And I think for trainees that may be in the audience, I wanna really emphasize that this open science approach is not at all incompatible with academic success. So you do not need to hoard your data to avoid being scooped and to have a successful career in academia. Um, in fact, I think it's just the opposite that it's very surprising how productive, just putting your data out there can be, putting your results, your methods, um, you will create more opportunities um, than those you, you imagine you might lose. Uh, all the software that I've described and more is available on GitHub at the Griffith Lab um, organization. All the data is made available as much as possible using CC0 or other open licenses. And I'll acknowledge all the members of the lab that make this work possible and um, our many great clinical collaborators um, for which basically all these projects are dependent. And I'll just thank our funding sources as well um, for supporting this work. And I'll be happy to take any questions. <laughs>